You may be seated. Open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. You probably notice you don't have a bulletin insert this week. I want to do something a little bit different. We got to the end of the message last week and I, I kind of ran out of time and I tried to squeeze in the last couple of things that I wanted to talk about and I don't feel like I did them justice. So today, instead of moving forward, we're going to tie up some loose ends from last week. Now I left some, uh, you should have a back of your bulletin that it's blank, so feel free to, to jot some things down. But what I'd really like you to do today, more than that, um, because th some of this is going to be review and you have a lot of this from your notes that you took last week. I'd like you to stay with me in the text. I'm going to bounce you around a little bit today. So I need you to you know, get your Bibles out and be ready to, be ready to move because um, we're going to be in the Scriptures. And I really want you to go to the Scriptures when we're in a particular text and I want you to, to be with me there more than being concerned about writing some things down. Um, we're going to be focused on the last part of verse 3 in Revelation chapter 3 and all of uh, verse 4. But to get that all in context, uh, let's read the, the entire text, the entire message uh, that Christ has for the church in Sardis. So follow along with me as I read, starting in verse 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things, says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy." He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, always when we come into the uh, presence of your word, um, it's always a continuation of our worship. We aren't stopping... Uh, our worship. We, we've, we've prayed and we've sung songs to you. Um, when we open up this book, we are exposed to your, your, your person, your attributes, and your work. And that always should uh, incite within us adoration and worship. And so as you expose yourself to us today, as you reveal yourself to us, your person and your work, uh, let that be, let, let that fill our hearts uh, with wonder and with awe. Uh, we continue to worship you as we uh, study your word together. And I want to lift up uh, Mickey and Brian uh, and the little ones who are so precious to you. Uh, what, we know you're present in here with us and we know that you're also very present uh, with them right now. And uh, be with them and uh, open up their, their young minds and their eyes to understand you in a, a new and fresh way this morning. We thank you in advance. In Christ's name, amen. That's Mickey in there. Yeah, take it a break. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay. Um, last week... Of course, Jesus is uh, addressing this dead church, and after he calls them that, he gives them five 
specific exhortations. And the last one being to repent. And the, the middle of verse 3, he mentions that there's a consequence for not repenting. He said, therefore, if you will not watch, and he's talking about all of the exhortations, if you will not repent, if you will not um, respond to my words of exhortation, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. Now, I'm reading out of the New King James. We talked about this last week, and we, I brought up the, 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 the Greek word thief, and how there are two Greek words for thief. One word is a thief that comes with violence, with a weapon, and the other thief is a thief that comes with stealth. He sneaks up on the person or the victim. And the word that Jesus uses here is the second one. It's he, The thief is coming in a stealthy way, sneaky, uh, catching the victim unaware. The other thing that we did with the words in this verse is we looked at the two words, that, and the, one, the word that's most prevalent, and I think in a lot of the translations that you might have, is that Christ says that he's going to come against this church. Now, the New King James has a pawn. I don't know which one you have. It's a Greek word, and it can mean either one. And we said last week that if Christ is saying that he's going to come against this church, then that probably means that he's going to come against them in some, some type of disciplinary way. He's going to bring discipline upon that church. And that's biblical, Hebrews 12, 6 and 7. God disciplines those he loves. But I offered another suggestion, and it's, it goes along with the word upon. Let me read that to you again using the word upon, just in case you have against. If you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. And I suggested that if the word is upon and it's not against, that this is a, a, a warning that Christ is giving this church, that he's, going, that he's warning them about his, his return, which could happen at any point in time. Now, these, these saints are receiving this letter in the middle of, you know, 95, 96 AD, and, and Jesus is, is telling them, my return is imminent, I will come upon you. If you're not going to watch, if you're not going to respond and repent, I will come upon you. The, 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 the chance is, is that I could return. Now, what I'd like you to do, and I referenced this last week, but we didn't go there, I'd like you to turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. If you're not sure where that is, it's going to be hard to find. It might be easier to go to the table of contents because it's really kind of right in the middle of the New Testament. It's not a large book. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. This is the Apostle Paul writing. But concerning the times... And the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as, as a thief in the night. Now, now listen, look up here. One of the reasons why Paul is saying that he has no need to write to them about this subject is because Paul, when he was in Thessalonica, spoke at great length about these types of things, the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ. He spent a lot of time talking to them about that. Now, if you look in the book of Acts, where when Paul was in Thessalonica, it's interesting, and it's always been interesting to me, that Paul wasn't there very long. He was there a matter of weeks before he got run out of town. And yet, in the small amount of time that Paul was in Thessalonica, these guys had a very good teaching from the Apostle Paul on the subject of eschatology. Last things, the study of last things. Things like the day of the Lord and the second coming of Christ and even teaching on very specific things. 
which I find interesting because you can sit in churches for week after week after week, not this church, but in other churches, and never hear things about Bible prophecy or about the second coming of Christ. Paul was in Thessalonica for a matter of weeks, and these people knew an awful lot about those kinds of things. Paul did not leave those out of his systematic theology, whatever he was teaching while he was there. And we know that if you, if you flip over to 2 Thessalonians, just go over a few pages and just look at, for, for an example, and I could give you other examples, but look at chapter 2. In verse 1, Paul writes this, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Verse 5, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Now that's some pretty specific stuff. Paul is talking and writing about there, about the Antichrist. And so Paul didn't just talk about Jesus is coming soon. He went into very specific detail, and here he's reminding them of some of those details, and he finishes it off by saying... Remember? Remember when I told you these things? Okay? Back to chapter 5. Where we left off. Verse 3. For when they say, these are just normal people, not the church, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, he's talking to the Thessalonican believers now, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Now, something else you need to know about these believers in Thessalonica is that they were very faithful. I don't want to take the time to go there, but all throughout this letter, Paul compliments this church on their faithfulness. These were a faithful bunch, these believers in Thessalonica. And Paul's saying, this day is not going to catch you unawares. You're watching. You're faithful. But listen to what he says next. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So in other words, what Paul is saying there is he's saying, I know this day is not going to catch you as a thief because you're watching. But then what does he do? He exhorts them. He says, keep watching. Don't stop. Now, because he, had, because he said that, there's the, there could be a propensity for believers, even faithful ones, to stop. And Paul's encouraging them and exhorting them not to do that. Now look at how he finishes this. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So Paul is exhorting these believers, don't stop, don't stop watching, keep waiting, keep being awake. People who, there are people who sleep, who this day will catch them unawares, but you're not like that. But keep watching, don't stop watching. And then at the end, he finishes, off, finishes it off by saying, listen, in the end, whether we wake or sleep, we live together with him. Now that word sleep is a word that means spiritual lethargy. So what Paul is saying at the end of this text, he's saying, keep watching, don't sleep, but in the end, whether you wake or sleep, we live together with him. Now some might point back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and that's the famous rapture text where 
Christ is, or I'm sorry, Paul is talking about the coming of Christ for his church, and that word sleep is used again. It's at least translated sleep in our English translations. The believers were wondering, okay, Jesus is coming again, but what happens to people who, are, who have died? Paul, we're alive, what happens to people who, are, who have died? And listen to what Paul says. And this is a familiar text, starting in verse 13. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. There's that word. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will also will bring those with him who sleep in Jesus. For the, and now he's talking about people who are dead, who have passed away. Christians, people who have become believers in Christ who have died. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we, which, uh, which we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the, the Lord in the air and so shall, we, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Can you go get me a glass of water? Please. Somebody? Okay. Um, now, Paul uses the word sleep there multiple times. And in verse, chapter 4, he's talking about people who have passed away, people who have died. The interesting thing is, when he gets to chapter 5, the word sleep, the Greek word for sleep that's translated into English, sleep, in the, in the chapter 5 text that we read, is a different Greek word. It's a different Greek word for sleep. It's two Greek words. You know, Paul is using this sleep word in chapter 4 as a metaphor, the way other biblical writers use it, uh, to, just, to, to, uh, to talk about somebody who's dead. They're asleep. You know? Um, that's the way Paul uses it in chapter 4. In chapter 5, just a few verses later, sleep is used again. Ooh, bottled water. Fancy. Paul uses a different word for sleep. And, and I'm going to suggest to you it's, it's a word that means spiritual, spiritual lethargy. Now, we connected that last week. I didn't take you into Thessalonians last week. We connected that with a text that I quoted out of 1 John, chapter 2, verse 28. The Apostle John, writing 1 John, also wrote the book of Revelation. Now little children abide in him, that when he may appear we may have confidence and not be ashamed. Before him at his coming, I asked the question last week, is it possible that when Christ comes, there will be people who will stand before him and be ashamed at his coming? Yes. It's exactly what the Apostle John is warning his readers about in 1 John, 1, 1 John 2, 28. Okay? So, back to Revelation chapter 3. Let's look at that verse again, or the back half of verse 3. Therefore, if you will not watch, what, what, was, what was the first exhortation that, that Jesus made to this church? Look up here. It was wake up. It was wake up. That was his first exhortation. It was the first one he used. Wake up. Jesus says, if you will not wake up. So in other words, these believers were, were asleep. We talked about that last week. If you will not wake up, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Now, either interpretation works. The church, the church being come, uh, Christ coming against the church for discipline, or Christ coming upon the church as if he's warning them, you, be, you better be ready. You know, I could come at any time. And if you're not repenting, if you're not watching, I'm going to come, I'm going to come upon you, and you won't be ready for that. Um, and remember, historically, this is how the city was conquered. Twice. The city was not watchful. In fact, the final time it was conquered by the Romans, the guard on duty fell asleep, history tells us. And so this, this warning would resonate with, the, with, the, with the, the people who were in this church. They knew their city's history. But I, but I feel like the second interpretation upon and that the reference is to the second coming of Christ for his church fits better because when Christ 
the warning of discipline doesn't come this way. Um, hey, think about your own self. You're disciplining your children. Today's Father's Day. So you're a father and you're disciplining your child. And you don't... The, the warning of, of, of discipline uh, is not uh, be ready. Be watchful. My discipline's coming. My, my discipline is an overhanging event. It could happen at any time. That's not the language of discipline. That's, that's not how, you know, that's not the way that's, that's, that's worded. But that's the exact way, in fact, using even the word thief, that the second coming of Christ is used in, Thessalon in Thessalonians. Okay? So that's the first loose end I wanted to tie up. The second one has to do with verse 4. Let me just read verse 4 for you. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. So this is, a, 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 this is talking about the people with unsoiled garments in Sardis. Now we listed this verse under the commendation part of the letter. Some people say that this church uh, didn't really receive a, a commendation, and it, it, they, they would say that because it's not like the other commendation sections that we studied from the other churches. It doesn't read that way. This is more this. These are words of recognition from Christ to those who were living lives very differently from those around him. The whole church, or most of the church, was spiritually asleep. They were, they were spiritually lethargic. And Jesus singles out a few of the believers in Sardis and says, you'll, he says three things. They'll walk with me. He talks about them being dressed in white. And he says they are worthy. Okay? Now, I suggested last week that the reward or a reward for these faithful believers was walking with Christ. In, in the sense of they would experience intimacy relationally with him. Christ says, you have a few believers in Sardis, not many, but there's a few of you, and you will walk with me. You will experience closeness and intimacy with me. And then these believers, Jesus also calls them worthy. Now, we're going to talk about that. I'm going to say that I don't believe Jesus is saying that they're worthy enough to wear the white garments. What I'm going to suggest is that Jesus is saying that they are worthy to have intimacy relationally with him because of their, the, the way that they were conducting themselves. That was what made them worthy to have that intimacy, that close fellowship with him, which the majority of the people in the church in Sardis were not doing that. And they were living uh, lives very apart from Christ. We talked about the word dead and what the word dead meant last week and that it means separated. And the believers in Sardis were relationally separated from Christ. That's how they were living their Christian lives. Turn to the book of Colossians. Not too far away from Thessalonians. I should have told you that before. So Colossians is just one book to the left of Thess Thessalonians. We're going to go right to the first chapter. This is Paul again. And Paul says this in verse 10. Let me, let me start in verse 9 because that starts the section. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This is a prayer by Paul. Okay? Which are always really convicting. You can always tell what's important to you when you, you go back and replay the things that you're praying for, right? And so you listen to the prayers of Paul, and the things that he spent time uh, asking God for. And they're very oftentimes very different from the, from the times of prayer that we have. But listen to the things that Paul is requesting for these believers in Colossae. That they would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse 10. That you may walk worthy 
of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father. And now He's going to go into some list some spiritual truths, some things that are true about these believers, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He's delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Can a believer walk, listen, can a believer walk in an unworthy manner? Apparently, because Paul is praying that these believers would walk. That was his prayer for them, that they would walk in a worthy way, so they could walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Now, at the end of Paul's prayer, I said that he launches into the spiritual truth that these believers were to walk in, and I'm just bullet pointing him now here. Uh, God had qualified them to share in an inheritance. He delivered them from the, from, the, from the domain of darkness. God had given them citizenship into Christ's kingdom, and that could only happen because their sins had been forgiven. And remember last week, we went into Galatians 2.20. Christ loves you. He gave himself for you. That's how a worthy walk starts with those biblical truths. And then that leads you into 2 Corinthians 5.15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. He died for me, so I want to live for him. That's walking by faith. All right, And this, remember, is a prayer by Paul. It's not a guarantee that these believers are going to, that that's going to happen in their lives just because the Apostle Paul is praying for that to happen. But he's praying that that, that that kind of thing would happen to these believers, that they would continue to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Jesus, listen, to the ones who are living in Sardis that had not become unclean. He's talking to the few now, not the majority, not the spiritually lethargic, to the few. They were walking in a manner worthy, yes? Yes, they were. They were walking in faith. And you know what Jesus says? I'll walk with you right back. That's what he tells them. That's the, that's the reward. Those of you that are walking with me, I'm going to walk with you. Remember, we've said this before, the battle to live or to walk by faith is the battle to believe in the promises of God. Christ loved me and gave himself for me. Believing that gives you right standing before God. And remember, from last week, belief is not just knowing those two promises. It's what? It's getting into the wheelbarrow. Right? It's very easy to stand on the sideline and say, yeah, I believe that guy can go across that tightrope over the falls. Pushing a wheelbarrow. There's a big difference getting into the wheelbarrow. And, and understand something. I thought about that video last week. Don't, I don't want you to think that getting into the wheelbarrow is a work. It's not. It's not. But it's different than intellectual assent or just giving credence to something that's even true, even biblically true. It's placing your confidence in something. It's placing your trust in someone. And then what I suggested last week, and the way that we get tripped up when, we, when we're talking about walking by faith, is I think we, 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 we place our confidence in the finished work of Christ. We place our trust in that. We get into the wheelbarrow, and we're justified on the spot. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He was given his righteousness in a moment in time. But then after that, that's when we kind of drift into intellectual ascent. And so when we, th when we think about things like, Jesus loved me, and he gave his life for me. Galatians 2.20. We, it's, just, it's just intellectually we're giving credence to that biblical truth. I suggested last week, get into the wheelbarrow every day. Learn how to rest in that biblical truth. That's the key to walking by faith. And obedience is part of that. Part of that resting and trusting in the finished work of Christ. It's responding to what's been done for you. So that's the worthy walk. Now, these believers, back to Revelation, these believers in chapter 3 are dressed in white. I said last week, 
We defined that as the imputed righteousness that faith brings. And I went to the book of Zechariah. need you to go to Zechariah. Zechariah is easy to find. Go to Matthew. And then it's two books to your left. I told you, I promised you uh, that I wouldn't teach out of, the, out of the book of Leviticus. I made that promise a couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it's on tape, I think, so it, it really m means that Mark's going to have to teach that book when we get there. But I'm, I'm not going to promise that we're not going to teach, I'm not going to teach through Zechariah. I love the book of Zechariah. In verse 3, and remember, just as a review, Zechariah was a post-exilic prophet, prophesied to, uh, in, during a time when the exiles returned to Babylon. During that time, there was a high priest, his name was Joshua, and Zechariah, this post-exilic prophet, is receiving a vision from God, and he sees in the vision the high priest Joshua standing before the throne. And Joshua was a faithful high priest during this time. And it was a time when a lot of people were kind of up and down with their faithfulness. Maybe similar to the, the group at Sardis. Verse 1, Then he showed me Joshua the high priest, and Joshua here is representing the nation of Israel, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? He's talking about Israel coming back from the land of Babylon, being plucked from the fire. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. And then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head. And they put clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, and he says this. Listen to what the angel tells Joshua, the angel of the Lord. If you will walk... Ah! Right? If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house, and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. Now we said last week that the soiled clothes, and I'm not just saying this, verse 4 says this, that the soiled clothes removed were, was a symbol of the iniquity. Joshua's iniquity. The nation of Israel's iniquity. And the pure clothing placed on him was given to him. There was no merit. There was nothing meritorious that Joshua did to receive that. He was given those clothes. Then after he stands before the throne, positionally righteous. Now, how do you become positionally righteous? It's by faith and faith alone. We're studying that in the book of Romans. That's how it happens now. That's how it happened way back in the Old Testament. There's nothing meritorious you have to do. You just have to believe. After he's given this cloaked with righteousness that doesn't come from him, what did Joshua look like when he was standing before the throne in his own righteousness? Joshua was a good guy. He was a, he was a righteous high priest. But he was filthy in front of God. Isaiah 64, 6, our righteousnesses our filthy rags, they're not good enough. Even the good things that we do are tainted. That's how good God is. We are in need of righteousness that comes from outside of us. The righteousness that God acknowledges is his own righteousness he gives to us as a gift on the basis of faith alone. So, look, Joshua's standing before the throne. He's got his New shiny clothes on now. And what is, what, is, what is told him? Now, Joshua, look the part. If you will walk in my ways. Okay? First, he had to be supernaturally pleasing to God. He had to be pleasing to God in a supernatural way. People that lived back at that time would have looked at Joshua and saw pretty good guy. It's not what God saw. He was given a righteousness that was far and away and above what he had in and of himself. Once he's given this positional righteousness, God tells him, now go out and look the part. 
Israel had always been given their righteousness before the throne on the basis of faith, never on the basis of their own goodness. Joshua the high priest, his goodness, it was not enough. And even remember the priests in the Old Testament, all of them, before they could mediate before the people, had to be what? They had to be, there had to be sacrifices made for them. Okay? Now, I told you that story last week. You didn't go to Zechariah. I took you instead to Revelation 19. Go to Revelation 19. Because you're going to see white clothing given out in the book of Revelation multiple times in, in regards and relation to the church. And this is one of those texts starting in verse 5. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying Alleluia for the Lord God omnipotent reigns let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints and then skip over to verse 11 and you'll see this image again. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Christ coming back to this earth accompanied by his church. Now, there's many parallels between a Jewish wedding in Christ's day and the church as Christ's bride. This is not exhaustive. I don't want to take the time to go into a, an exhaustive study of this. Um, but let me just read what I've written and copied down here. The father of the groom... And, and while I'm reading these things, I'd like you to try to see the connections yourself. You're, you, some of these should just leap off the, the page to you. The father of the groom, this is a Jewish wedding, makes arrangements for the marriage by paying the bride price. The father of the groom initiates that. The groom travels to the home of the bride with the money for her family, with the, the, the price, and the bride has to consent. This is not a, a union that's forced on her. It's something that she desires. With the bride's consent and the purchase price, and I think we should do this. We have a couple that's getting married, so we should maybe, <laughs> we should act this out in real, do you think? With the bride's consent and the purchase price, the couple is legally, by law, entered into a marriage covenant. Now, there's no consummation of the marriage yet. But they're entered into this covenant. They're considered legally married. It's the period of engagement. Uh, but it's more binding. In our culture, it's not as binding. Um, it's, it's a little binding. It's, the ring is expensive, right? But it's, it was very binding back then. They are betrothed to one another. The bride is sanctified, set apart. She belongs to the groom. She is to keep herself pure for her husband. And this is the, the, the place where Joseph ran into a problem, remember? Because it was during this period of engagement that Mary was found to be pregnant by the Holy Ghost. And that's why Joseph was going to break off this this. this legally binding covenant that, that they had entered into and started. But in his mind, Mary had not kept herself pure. And so that's when the angel Gabriel had to come and 
you know, straighten things out with Joseph. Okay? Now, this engagement period is, is it's interesting because after this covenant is begun with the price paid for the bride, the, the groom returns to his father's house, goes back to the father. And during this time of betrothal, the couple are physically apart for sometimes up to a year. The groom spends this time preparing living accommodations for his bride. That's what he's doing. And the bride spends her time being watchful, looking out the window and waiting, keeping herself pure and ready. Because here's the thing. She knows the groom's coming, but she doesn't know when. He comes at a time that's completely unknown to her. And so her responsibility is to watch and to be ready and waiting. The groom actually doesn't even know because it's only the father of the groom who determines the timing. He's the one who tells the groom, go fetch your bride. It's time to go get your bride. The groom, escorted by male friends, goes to his bride and announces his presence with a shout. And he retrieves his bride and they enter into the groom's father's house for seven days. The couple's hidden away. And the marriage is consummated and after that the bride exits the house unveiled. Now prior to this seven day period, the bride undergoes a ceremony of ritual cleansing. All right, and so she undergoes the ceremony of ritual cleansing. The marriage is cons consummated. She's seven years hidden in the house of the, the, the groom's father. And when she comes out, she's unveiled, and then there's a, a wedding feast. All right, so I'm not going to walk you back through the text in Revelation. We're not going to go into all the, the, the details here and all the parallels, but hopefully you see some of these parallels between... A, 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 a Jewish wedding and the traditions and the customs in that culture in, the, in Jesus' time and the relationship between Christ now and his church. Um, this separation time, this period of time where the, the, the groom and the bride were apart, the, the bride is all during that time watching and proving herself faithful and pure. Listen, a worthy mate, worthy for the groom. Her chastity, her chasteness is a demonstration that her love is for her husband alone, not for anybody else. And in the end, at the wedding ceremony, she is dressed in white, which is a symbol of her faithfulness. So we are, as the Bride of Christ, in this period of engagement, it's an opportunity for us to prove ourselves faithful to Christ alone in doctrine and in practice. The faithfulness and the purity that the Bride shows, the, the chasteness that she shows, would that be a burden to the Bride? I don't think it would be. She's excited about her wedding. And she's excited to prove herself a worthy bride for the one she loves with all her heart. Okay? And so when you think about it in those terms, it makes tomorrow, Monday, not just another Monday, and not just another Tuesday the next day, but you are looking out the window is he coming yet? Is he here? You're watching. You're being watchful. You're ready. And all the while, you are proving your faithfulness and your chasteness and your purity. You want to prove that to, your, to the groom when he comes. 
to be found having been that way. I don't believe the white clothing given in the book of Revelation in chapter 3 or in chapter 19 is white clothing that's earned. I believe that it's given as the same way that it's given in the book of Zechariah. You're given a garment. It's positional righteousness. It's clothing that we receive by faith and faith alone. That's how you get your righteousness before God. But listen, just like Joshua, what did Joshua the high priest happen, what happened to him? He receives his clothing, his righteous clothing, and then God tells him, go look the part. Understand something. Positional righteousness and practical righteousness they, they go together. You know, when we're saved, salvation, we've talked about salvation in three tenses. We were saved. We were saved from the power of sin. We were justified in a moment in time. We are in the present being saved. That's the process of sanctification. We're being saved from the power of sin. That's in the present time now. And in the future, we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. That's glorification. And let me add a fourth one to that glorification when you're glorified and you are saved from the very presence of sin you're also going to be saved a fourth P from even the pleasure of sin sin won't even be pleasurable it won't even be looked at for even a moment like that so that's that's salvation as a whole now when we enter into a faith-based relationship with Christ you you can't, the Bible never makes this, gives you this option. Well, I want to be justified. I'm really interested in being glorified. But I'm not so much interested in Christ interfering with my life with this process of sanctification. I'm not down with that. I'm not interested in being saved from the power of sin. I want to just skip that part and just move right into glorification in the, in the distant future. Salvation is all of it. It's the whole thing. We're saved, that's justified, you were, sanctified, you are being, glorified, you will be. So positional righteousness, the righteousness that you get at justification, it, it moves very much into practical righteousness. That's, that's the pattern. And then into ultimately glorification where we become like Jesus. Last Last uh, text. Turn to the book of Titus. I promise. Another book you might need to look in the table of contents too, but it's really important. I want you to go to it. This is a, a, a text we've looked at before. Titus chapter 3, Paul writes this, For we ourselves were also foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we've done. You see that? God's kindness didn't come upon you because you did something good to deserve it or earn it. You didn't do anything meritorious. But according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified, declared righteous. Hey, a look up here. Zechariah, the high priest Joshua, given a, a righteous garment. He was given that having been justified, declared righteous by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Verse 8. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want to affirm constantly. That those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. 
positional righteousness leads into practical righteousness. I said to you, I don't believe the white garments in Revelation, either in chapter 3 or chapter 19, are your good works. They aren't, the white garment is not a reward. I believe it's positional righteousness. But if, but if, if, if the scriptures, if what I'm saying, if what Paul is saying here, it's, it's, it's both. <laughs> because those who are positionally righteous are, are going to find that an outworking of that righteousness into their lives in practical ways. Okay? As Christ's bride, we look forward to our marriage to the Lamb. That's Revelation 19, 7 and 8. We're expectant, we're watchful. During this period of engagement, our part is to make ourselves ready for that, that day, living out our positional righteousness in practical ways. Do you see it that way? This is the time you've been given to show Christ, the bridegroom, that you're devoted to him and him alone. Do you see it that way? Joshua needed a righteousness outside of his own in Zechariah. The faithful believers in Sardis needed it. They were cloaked with righteousness. They were cloaked with white. The overcomer needs it. That's the next verse down. With that imputed righteousness, the overcomer promise, we're given assurance our names remain in the book of life. So this, 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 this word name shows up in this letter a lot. You have a name that you're alive but you're dead. You know, the word name pops up in this message to Sardis over and over again. And Jesus here is talking about, you know, the name that you have, the reputation you have before men is not what it's all about. And I think that's where Sardis was. They were very interested in people recognizing that they had this, this reputation. They were, you know, they were this church but Jesus is saying in this letter that it's about being counted among the few names in Sardis who have unsoiled garments. The ones who are doing one thing while everybody else around them is doing another. Jesus says they'll walk with me. And they can do that because I'll clothe them in my righteousness which results in a worthy walk. It's not what makes them worthy. It results in a worthy walk. And their names can never be erased from the book of life. And on the day of judgment, they'll all receive special acknowledgement from me in front of all of heaven. That's what Jesus says at the end of this letter. I'm going to close this week by uh, reading to you the Overcomer Promises. I've got a Bible this week where the pages aren't sticky. So here are the overcomer promises. We're reading these promises and you are receiving them without a lot of fanfare and explanation. Just like the first recipients received these promises. Listen to the words of Christ as he holds out these promises to you. To him who overcomes I will give to eat from the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. And they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I have also received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. To the church of Sardis, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
please stand. Bow with me, pray for the offering. Father, it's exciting oh, what's happening with this church and the things that you're accomplishing and doing, and it's your work, it's not ours, and we're uh, just uh, very privileged and honored and humbled to be a part of that. We ask that you would take the money that was collected today and use it um, to further the gospel. Um, there's a, a huge lost world out there, and um, use the each dollar um, to bring people to you. Um, again, thank you for the privilege of being able to, to give and participate in your work. In Christ's name, amen. For the benediction, uh, the words of Jesus to his disciples in the upper room, uh, not to Judas, He's, he wasn't here for this one. He had left already. But to the eleven, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you might be also. Hey, are you ready for that? Are you ready for him? Are you watchful? The Apostle Paul, if you are, I was expecting a few yeses. <laughs> if you are, Sure. If, you're, if you're watching and you're ready, the Apostle Paul would say the same thing to you that he said to the, those in Thessalonica. He would say, keep watching. Keep being watchful.